Okay, so welcome to our uh, One Health seminar series. Tonight's talk is entitled um, One Health and the Antimicrobial Stewardship um, in the Pork Industry. Um, so if you have not yet been to a One Health talk um, here at DelVal, um, our One Health seminar series focuses on the interrelationship between plants, animals, and the environment. Um, it is both a local and a global effort. Um, and our seminar series itself focuses on a wide variety of topics um, that cover uh, not only people and animals, but also human health, um, the environmental health, um, and today, um, the interrelationship here between the pork industry um, and uh, other things. Uh, I don't want to give away too much. Um, so our speaker is uh, Dr. Heather Fowler. She is a public health veterinarian, um, and she is currently the director of <laughs> producer and public health, public health, sorry, uh, producer of, um, the Director of Producer and Public Health at the National Pork Board. Turn it around. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. Um, Dr. Shenko left out the fact that she and I went to high school together. Totally left that part out. She was, she's older than me, though. Um, <laughs> Um, so yes, my name is Dr. Heather Fowler. I'm a public health veterinarian. And the reason I told Dr. Shaco to give me a short introduction is because I built some of that already into the slide. Um, one of the things you'll find with One Health as you explore opportunities um, and careers is that folks come from very different backgrounds. In general, veterinarians, we get it. Just so you know, we get it. Um, especially since when we talk about One Health, we talk about human health, animal health, and environmental health all overlapping. So I know a lot of you guys come from the wildlife angle. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to cover that at all. We're going to really focus on domestic species here. Um, but definitely, that's a huge realm for One Health research um, if you're interested in infectious disease and things like that. But again, just wanted to walk you through my career trajectory. I also like to give folks an outline. I was that student that in class I would fall asleep and would want to know kind of when is she almost done? Is he almost done? Like, when's this going to end? So once I get to stewardship activities in the swine industry, know that I'm wrapping up. Um, but hopefully you'll enjoy uh, the, the presentation I put together for you. So starting first with a little background of me and my, um, my upbringing. Originally from Trenton, New Jersey. Um, always wanted to be a veterinarian ever since I was little. Thought I would be a cat and dog veterinarian, own my own practice, live happily ever after. Um, went to Penn State for undergrad, that's me and the Nittany Lion there. Um, and then Hawaii happened. So I was on this fast track to small animal practice. I did what many students do and you may be doing now if you think, or if you're considering graduate school or other um, opportunities. In order to bolster your CV, you may travel abroad, um, get different research experiences or just kind of working experience. Um, and so I went to Hawaii really just to build up my CV to say I did research one summer and then I kind of got bitten by the epi bug, the public health bug, and started to look into research a little bit more. Now I still wanted to be a veterinarian so I went on to vet school at the University of Pennsylvania um, in Philadelphia. I was actually there this afternoon. That's my first spay dog. So the first dog I've ever spayed it took me about four hours. Um, it was a gravid spay so she just had babies. So the uterus is enlarged at that point, so I like to justify the fact that it took me four hours for probably a 20, 30 minute surgery, um, but it was also my first time. Um, then immediately after, I went to Yale, so after vet school, um, graduated in 2010, I went and I got a one year master's in public health um, from the Yale School of Public Health. Now, remember it says profile of a perpetual student, so I just, I kept going from there. After completing my MPH, I went and I worked at the um, Minnesota Department of Health as a CSTE or CDC, so Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, people know that. CSTE is the Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists. And they have a program that they co-lead with the CDC that is an Applied Epidemiology Fellowship. It's very similar to the EIS program. If you've seen the movie Contagion, that's actually based on the EIS program and how they have kind of outbreak chasers um, that help identify sources of outbreaks and address those outbreaks. Um, so worked there for two years. I got to work as a veterinary epidemiologist. So this was my kind of break from formal education um, to start to apply my knowledge in um, public health and epidemiology. 
Um, I also got to play with a lot of fun animals. This is at a petting zoo. Um, so I got to follow up on um, disease outbreaks, often those um, that are due to contact with animals. Does anyone know what that's called when you get a disease from an animal? Yeah, zoonotic diseases. So I worked on the zoonosis team. So it was a lot of diarrhea, mostly, right? Um, but all that were due to contact with animals. So I got to work on that group, um, do, do a lot of outbreak chasing and things like that. Again, perpetual student, so it keeps going. Um, I'm trying to fill, in, fill you guys into that alphabet soup behind my name. So immediately after finishing that fellowship, I went on to work at the Center for One Health Research um, at the University of Washington in Seattle, um, where I worked on my PhD, which had an emphasis on um, worker safety and health of animal workers. So some of the folks, again, wildlife workers, we had a student that studied um, diseases that wildlife workers are at risk of getting, um, other hazards that they may be exposed to. I worked with mostly small animal veterinarians and some of the bite scratches and needle stick injuries that they succumb to as a result of their work. Um, I also got to play, I don't know if you can see, those are little chicken butts. There's one, there's another one. Um, I got to play with some backyard chickens in Seattle. So backyard poultry was really, really common um, or becoming more popular, I should say, in areas like Seattle, Washington, where folks just want to get back in touch with agriculture. Um, you hear of the locavore movement, but as a public health veterinarian, I reserve the right to be a Debbie Downer at all parties, and so I have to remind folks that there's a way to have contact with animals, but it's important to do so safely. And so reminding them of the risk of salmonella, we've seen tons of outbreaks each and every year, honestly, around this time that are due to contact with chickens because people are starting to interact with them um, similar to how you would cats and dogs. So they're holding them close, they're kissing them, they're bringing them in the house. If they get chicks, they keep them in their house in their bathtub and things like that. So just making sure that folks were aware of the risk. If you look at my hand there, I have a swab, a gloved hand, first of all, important to use your PPE, personal protective equipment. Um, but I was doing some swabs of the area, again, to help um, tell the story of disease risk by isolating some of those pathogens. I was also um, an, a bullet environmental fellow. This guy here is Dennis Hayes, one of the founders of Earth Day. He funded um, a fellowship that helped support my PhD work. And then I also got to work as a clinical veterinarian because I get that question a lot of times, like, when are you going to be a real vet? First of all, that's offensive. Second of all, um, I can, you know, so veterinarians do so much. Um, but I have worked clinically um, in Seattle. There was a homeless and low-income clinic called the Doni Pet Memorial Clinic. It was named after the veterinarian that first started it at Pike's Place. Essentially took out his doctor bag um, and went and treated, dewormed, vaccinated, um, and treated um, animals at Pike's Place in Seattle. Um, and it became more formalized. We actually operated out of a um, homeless shelter. This is the chapel region here um, of a homeless shelter in Seattle. And so I got to treat some cute little kittens. I don't know if you can see the little kittens. One of my technicians there smiling at the kittens. So happy to say that that's kind of where my education ended. Um, I graduated in June of last year um, from the 27th grade, if you were counting up to that point, um, and started work at the National Pork Board as the director of producer in public health. So first, I want to cover terminology. So apparently I, hold on, I must have practiced. I must have practiced this and recorded myself. That's weird. Okay. So um, I like to start with terminology, with the disclaimer that I will go back on my word. Um, so has anyone seen this definition of antibiotic? So um, a lot of times we kind of colloquially use the term antibiotic to mean just a drug that you use to treat bacterial infections, and then we use antimicrobials. Um, we may or may not use antimicrobials, right? Um, but if we use antimicrobials, we use it as more of an umbrella term, and that's somewhat appropriate. But for antibiotics, antibiotics really refer to those natural, naturally occurring substances that are produced by one microorganism to um, kill another. So 
Um, the origin of penicillin was essentially contamination of a petri dish, right? So we found out that a fungus produced, produced excuse me, um, an organism that prevented bacterial growth. And so that was all by accident because that's already occurring in the natural environment. What we've moved on to recently was development of antimicrobials, which are um, natural synthetic, semi-synthetic um, compounds that kill other microorganisms. And so it really is an umbrella term, um, but I will probably, I will try to use, so I will try to use the word antibiotics for the rest of the presentation, but folks for, for folks that are microbiologists or if you have a background in microbiology, I just want to make it clear that I understand the difference between the two definitions. What you'll see a lot of times is um, we use antibiotics when we're talking to the general public. Um, and at the pork board, we use it a lot for our pig farmers and our pig farmer education. And then antimicrobials, um, scientists or in technical language, we'll use that term amongst ourselves because we're trying to be as accurate as possible. Um, and then this bullet, as it points out, all antibiotics are antimicrobial because they fit under that um, umbrella, but not all antimicro or antimicrobials are antibiotics. So again, I will use the word antibiotics. Just know that some folks are, may ask you antibiotic or antimicrobial, and that's what they're referring to. Now when we talk about antibiotic resistance, um, and I also should apologize that if, I, if you see antimicrobial throughout this presentation, I said I used antibiotic, that is my fault, because even still, I will go back and forth with what term I use. But we're all really talking about the same thing. Now, if you look in the news, if you just Google antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance, you'll see all different types of studies that talk about superbugs, about it existing in the environment, in pets, in our cells. Um, they'll cover various topics, such as prescribing practices of um, physicians. Also, the CDC, um, another thing, again, as I mentioned, communicating to the public, the CDC talks about antibiotic use. Um, they have a number of stats that they put out, that first bullet being the main one that they use to justify their work in this realm, which is that we have two million people each year that we suspect um, suffer with some kind of antibiotic resistant infection, and that of those, 23,000 die from those infections. And remember that the CDC is very focused on U.S. issues, so it's a national organization. The line stops very clearly at Canada and Mexico kind of thing, um, and so they don't collect those values. But the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, looks globally at all countries, right? And so they'll have either folks report in or they'll have ways to collect that data. And so they estimate that 700,000 deaths occur worldwide due to antibiotic-resistant infections. Um, some other stats that you'll hear from time to time often deal with the prescribing of antibiotics, whether it's appropriate or necessary. Um, and that's what this infographic, again, is trying to show. Of when is it really necessary, and are we prescribing antibiotics appropriately? Before we dive too deep um, into the conversation, um, again, if you've had your microbiology course already, this is one of the things that you cover, which is the mechanism of resistance. So um, antibiotics work either by killing um, killing or stopping the growth. So they're either bacterial static or bacterial cidal. Um, and they have other various methods. Um, I've listed five methods here by which they do so. They achieve this end. And it's either by um, compromising the integrity of the cell itself, so perforate causing little holes in there, um, also inhibiting cell synthesis, excuse me. Um, let's see, what else do we have? inhibiting protein synthesis, so it either interferes with the metabolism or the growth, and thereby, again, either stopping, inhibiting the growth, or overall killing the cell. So with that said, um, oh, sorry, and so this just kind of puts an emphasis on the protein synthesis. We all know where proteins are created. With that said, resistance, in general, it goes against the mechanism of action, right? So it either will change the target, so if the compound is working in a specific spot, it can adjust and change the shape of it so that it no longer interacts. Um, it can break it down, so we hear of um, uh, beta-lactamases, so it'll break down the actual compound, things like that, or actually block, 
um, entry or pump out. So we'll have efflux, efflux pumps. So the, the compound will get into the bacterial cell and on its way to the target, essentially uh, like a revolving door that just pumps it right out. So it identifies it and just kind of pumps it right out. But again, the same ways that we have, oh, sorry. Um, and then resistance is either carried on the plasmid, and so here's an example of the plasmid, or the chromosome itself. So there's different ways that resistance can be conferred. And you'll learn in your micro class, if you haven't already, that there's um, this plasmid is really easy to share, right? Um, so there's a lot of just sharing among bacterial populations in a given environment, um, which can drive resistance. This just shows you kind of pictorially what I was mentioning before in terms of the targets, antibiotic targets. Um, and then how resistance occurs, and then um, what are those different drugs. These are the broad um, categories or drug classes that are impacted. So um, beta-lactams are one of the largest ones. Penicillin falls into that category. This here is just a, a timeline that you can also access on the CDC's website of resistance, um, just showing that essentially um, once we had penicillin, we found penicillin resistance really um, and started using it therapeutically. Because remember, we found penicillin um, from a contamination event in the, in the lab, right? So um, once we used it when resistance developed, and it kind of goes down the line of the different types of resistance that we see, often, um, often with a specific pathogen that it's either resistant towards or a class um, that it's resistant that develops resistance against. So. And then when we talk about resistance, um, it's really about bacterial populations. So I have to remind folks, um, when we talk about responsible use as a solution, we really need to think about um, the population. So again, CDC did a really good job putting this infographic together. So the red bugs are said to be the resistant ones. So when you use antibiotics, the blue ones are susceptible, they die, but then that leaves room for the, the red ones to continue to grow and um, reproduce. Um, and then they can even, if they're in that environment, remember I mentioned some of those plasmids can be shared um, from cell to cell, and so they can actually share, this is supposed to be kind of a zoom in of that, they can share that resistance with one another. So then when if you have a, a condition, so say you want to treat someone, well, then they have this. They still will probably have clinical signs if this bug was the one that was causing the disease. And so then you're stuck with this bacterial infection, um, which remember the CDC, we said we have about 2 million that we see each year, but then you have to either use a new drug that it's then susceptible to or find another way to help treat that infection. When it comes to um, messaging around antibiotic resistance, um, it can be... Um, uh, really polarizing, really kind of scary, um, focusing often on um, suspected causes of resistance. So this is from the WHO, and it's really pointing out, you know, prescribing practices of physicians, you know, essentially doling out antibiotics as if they were candy, right? Well, we know that, and I tried to suggest that when we talked about those populations, that um, when we talk about resistance, um, even justify or judicious use, so use even if justified, can drive resistance. And again, it goes back to that population that we talked about before. So if this was a clinically ill animal, as a veterinarian, I would say, okay, hopefully I had some idea of what was causing it. So either clinical suspicion, this animal had a urinary tract infection, usually caused by E. coli, say, um, and so I can use drug A and then I go ahead and treat, well then it, the clinical signs, because we have the resistant bug, will persist. And then from there, whether I submit a culture and sensitivity to get a better idea of what drugs that this particular bug is susceptible to, what the bug itself is, I can then proceed with my medical treatment. Um, there is a such thing as pan resistance. We don't see that that often, thank God. Um, but that means resistant to everything um, or in human health, we'll see um, multi-drug resistant um, organisms, and from there, it can be really difficult. They often consult um, an, infect an infectious disease specialist that will help identify the best drug um, to attack a given bug, but that's based on 
you need to submit those um, cells. You have to grow them in the culture to understand what they are, one, and again, what their resistance profiles are. So some fun quotes that have been told to me over the years is one man's abuse is another's uh, judicious use. Again, are you using um, antibiotics responsibly? Is it, do you need it all the time? Are you treating the least number of animals? And we'll talk about that, or humans. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later as it relates to swine. And someone also, a microbiologist, told me, if you think you understand antimicrobial resistance, it wasn't explained to you well. And we're still starting to, to learn so much more about how resistance um, is shared with bacterial cells. So we know they can share that plasmid. Um, we know some of the different genes that are carried on those plasmids. And we're even starting to see resistance to certain metals, like copper and silver, I believe, on, um, on those metals, because we'll use those um, elements at times, um, either as a supplement and feed or for some of its antimicrobial properties. So um, when it comes to, in the swine industry, one of the things that folks get hung up on or there's some confusion about is what is the indication for use? So I just wanted to highlight there that there are two types of use that we think about, two broad categories, and that's the therapeutic and non-therapeutic use. And the main indications as listed there, and I've tried to highlight in red what I consider to be therapeutic, or excuse me, non-therapeutic, um, in that second bullet. And so we have treatment. So treatment is when you have disease is present and the animal is showing clinical signs of disease. So then you have to treat. Also in that treatment situation, you'll have a control issue. So if one person in this room is sick with something that the rest of you guys can get, right? Um, each year I feel like there's a menseria meningitidis outbreak and not to scare you guys, but in dormitories and colleges. And that's because, um, one, it's communicable, so it can be transmitted person to person. Um, and two, oftentimes in our dormitories, you're kind of um, stacked on top of each other, right? You live in very close proximity. There's a number of folks that um, share a given floor, or you know, sometimes they're even co-ed um, dormitories, things like that. So given that you're so close together, it helps to spread some of those infections. Um, but that would be an example of um, the controlling a, a disease. So think of it as an outbreak. How do we stop it? There have been people or animals um, that may have been exposed to the sick person or animal, and so we need to control that. That's control. And then prevention is generally um, if there's a suspicion of introduction or there will be an introduction, um, prevention prevents essentially the development of clinical signs. So um, to relate that to the human health world, if you guys travel to um, a country that has um, malaria, say, your doctor will say, okay, what country are you going to? And you tell them, and the CDC actually puts together, I think it's a yellow book, it's for travel. Um, and so they have an understanding of what the epidemiology or the risk of the different diseases are in different countries, and they'll recommend um, for physicians, they have guidelines out there for physicians of what to prescribe. So it could be vaccines. In the case of malaria, they may put you on anti-malarials. Um, so you haven't had it yet, but you're going somewhere where there's the risk of introduction. So again, that's prevention. And then finally, you have feed efficiency or growth promotion, which is a non-therapeutic use. Um, we'll use, you may see from time to time in the food animal world, where you use um, antibiotics or other supplements for growth promotion purposes, and that just helps um, convert uh, feed to muscle, which is the, the product that we're producing um, in the food animal realm. I have a note here that as of, oh, push that button, you told me about. Um, as of January 1st, um, 2017, so last January, not this past one, um, the FDA, so the Food and Drug Administration, banned the use of medically important antibiotics for the use of growth promotion purposes. And then all other uses of those medically important antibiotics fall under um, either what is called a veterinary feed directive um, for feed grade or antibiotics in the feed or prescription for antibiotics in the water. So those are um, specific regulations that deal only with food animals and only with medically important antibiotics. Has anyone heard that phrase, medically important? 
So from time to time, um, you will hear that. And medically important essentially comes down to it um, being important for human diseases. And so the WHO has a list of medically important antibiotics for human diseases. The OIE, or the World Organization of Animal Health, it's a um, French organization, has a list for um, antibiotics that are medically important for veterinary medicine. And you can imagine there's a lot of overlap there. Um, essentially, they're important for specific diseases. And so some of the diseases that we can get as humans, animals can get as well. Um, I'm trying to think if there are, FAO, I think, agrees with OIE. Um, but there are a number of different um, organizations that will have different lists. And the FDA has a list of medically important antibiotics as well, though it closely um, agrees with the WHO definition. So as we mentioned, um, with non-therapeutic antibiotic use, um, folks often question whether prevention falls in that realm. As a veterinarian, I don't think so. Um, again, in human medicine, we use um, different things um, pr prophylactically or for preventative purposes as well. Um, you'll also hear this kind of routine use, and I think that comes from a place of um, um, ignorance, honestly, not knowing what exactly they're talking about. Um, this is an agriculture school, so folks may not know um, how we use cattle, how we use um, small ruminants or things like that, or, or chickens or whatever, and so they may use terms based on a lack of understanding. And so when someone says, oh, don't you routinely use this for blah, you know, I ask them what they mean by routine because it should fall back to those indications. So it's either for treatment, control, um, or prevention of disease. Um, and then prior to um, January 1st, 2017, it might have been used for growth promotion purposes. But always make sure that um, when folks are having conversations around antibiotic use, in animal agriculture that I have folks clarify their question. So if you say, oh, if you have that question as well, I'll just ask you to expand by what you mean by routine. So this is what I mentioned before about the medically important antimicrobials. Um, it's really kind of all of them, if you ask me. There are a couple that are left out. Um, they, this does not include ionophores, which are antimicrobials, though we use them as antiprotozoans most, most of the time, um, though they can cover other um, bacterial infections as well. Um, again, this is from the WHO. And so when we say medically important, it's important to, so I'm not gonna fall off the stage. Um, it's important that the medically important is that umbrella term. And then from there, they have just plain old important, highly important, critically important, and then they have the highest priority. And those highest priority are the broad spectrum kind of last line of defense antibiotics. And all of these are used in veterinary medicine very broadly, um, because as I mentioned before, OIE and the WHO, if you look at their medically important antibiotics, you'll see a lot of overlap. Um, and if we have chance, uh, time, I can show you that. I have a slide in a different slide deck that I can show you. So, um, and then I mentioned before the VFD banned the use of medically important antibiotics for growth promotion purposes. Um, you can still use um, certain, again, the non-medically important, so the ones that weren't on those lists, that, that list, there's still a number of antibiotics, or um, uh, they're classified as antibiotics or antimicrobials that you can still use in the feed. Now, when we talk about antibiotic resistance, I like to throw this up as comic relief. Um, this pops up on my, my Facebook timeline. Um, each um, Halloween, and so it is a really scary topic, and as a result, it can be a very polarizing topic. Um, and with polarizing topics, we often see there's somewhat of a blame game with everyone pointing fingers at one another, but you need to realize if you, you point the finger at someone else, the hand will ultimately be pointed at you at some point. And that's why, so transition into One Health, I'm really excited about um, the One Health approach and how it's really taken up in different universities throughout the country. And that's because One Health is really based on this underlying principle of interconnectedness between human health, animal health, and environmental health. So those three sectors, you can't really just study them in silos, even though honestly that's how our, our training and our education, that's how our universities are broken up. Um, if there is a medical school and a vet school on the same campus, they often don't chat. 
They may even be on separate campuses or um, geographically separated. But we're realizing more and more that a lot of the issues in our global society um, are so interconnected that we need to work collaboratively across those different sectors to help um, find the best solution. Now, as a, um, I forgot to mention, during my time at the Center for One Health Research, I was one, a graduate student, so working on my PhD, but I was also the associate director of that Center for One Health Research. And so I had um, somewhat of an administrative leadership role there. And so one of the things I did was when we, and this is a tree, by the way, if there was any question of that, my word cloud. Um, I had, a, had the students that were graduating around the same time I did. We had some master students that we had trained, two or three of them. And we would get together for lab meetings from time to time. And so I had them define One Health for me. And this was at the end of their two-year education master's in public health from the University of Washington. And I've already highlighted the word think there. Think is as big or bigger than environmental, animal, and human approach. Um, not bigger than One Health, because everyone says One Health is, right? Well, they said, I think One Health is. And that just showed me that um, when we talk about One Health, it's still very conceptual in people's heads, like, yeah, I get it. These things are intertwined. Um, we should study them holistically, yes, I get that. But when it comes to operationalizing or actually implementing the One Health practice, it can be difficult for folks to do. And so that was a good kind of wake up call for us um, as the leadership in the lab to think harder about how we actually teach our students to apply it. So you can teach them the kind of, um, you can tell them, teach them about the framework or the paradigm itself but you need to teach them how to implement it. And so hopefully, um, if you guys have questions, I can take it, um, help you kind of brainstorm ways that you fit in the, the One Health paradigm. Um, but definitely working in the agricultural schools, um, working with animals, um, ultimately you definitely have a role to play. It's just whether you um, resolve to stay in your silo or work collaboratively across those different now, when it comes to antimicrobial resistance, see, I did it. I, I've been saying antibiotic and antimicrobial. I apologize. But um, when it comes to AMR or ABR, um, it really is a One Health topic. And so this, some of the contents of this slide were actually inspired by a colleague of mine in Minnesota who does work as um, a, a veterinary epidemiologist as well, who is employed by the health department to specifically focus on antimicrobial resistance as a One Health issue. Uh, so she gave me the idea of some of these, um, uh, the, the sub-bullets here. Um, and I just wanted to put this out there so you can see that in all the different sectors here, all three of them of the, the framework represented here, we do in fact see um, antibiotic or antimicrobial use. So obviously in human health, medicine, animal health, medicine, environmental health we often forget about. Um, and I would argue that it's not one health without the environment represented. One, um, human health and animal health, a lot of our um, waste will go into the environment, um, whether it's through wastewater treatment plants, and we know wastewater treatment plants for human waste isn't 100% effective at removing um, some of those, um, even the metabolites that have been excreted um, from getting into the environment. So the environment can be a recipient um, but it also can be used directly in the environment. So for plant agriculture, a lot of our tree um, fruit may use antibiotics. Um, I'm not sure if you guys use any here for some of the tree fruit, um, but coming from Washington State, it was an apple state, a tree fruit state. Um, you may, they may at times actually use tetracyclines, which is um, a medically important antibiotic. Maybe if you've been put on um, tetracycline at some point in your life, in veterinary medicine, we use tetracycline um, quite a bit. It's, it's really effective at a number of different pathogens, regardless of species. Um, so just to kind of put it out there that, you know, this really is a One Health issue, and it really transcends, transcends those three sectors of health. Now, the great thing about One Health is, you know, if we have a shared role in the problem, then we should have a shared role in the solution. And that should encourage us not only to work collaboratively, but share our, success and our successes and our failures. So one good thing, and this is a very fuzzy picture, I apologize. Um, this is an example of an antibiogram. So you have the different um, uh, 
um, bacterial species here, and then you have the drugs at the top, and then it shows you the percentage that were um, susceptible um, within uh, the, the different boxes. And so it, it gives you a good, an antibiogram in general gives you a good snapshot of what bugs have you been seeing, what's their profile like, are they resistant to everything, are they susceptible to everything, when should I be worried? And so we use it a lot um, in the human health world, maybe not so much as we should in the veterinary world, but starting to use it a little bit more. But I think would be, what would be, excuse me, even more informative is to have an antibiogram that really spoke to a given region. So think of a hospital that may be here and then a veterinary hospital here, and they get their two separate antibiograms, but we know that the people that go to this hospital and that go to this vet school probably live in the same, or excuse me, vet hospital, probably go or live in the same area. It's the same kind of catchment area. So if you had a regional antibiogram that sure you can break down by species, it would be a little bit more telling of the bugs that are um, living in our environment. So just one example, throwing it out there. And that was some of the work that we had, um, um, that I had worked on at the University of Washington and that's actually ongoing. They're trying to do a statewide antibiogram, again, to get a better picture of resistance across those different species or uh, those different sectors, I, I should say. Also, a quick comment about um, stewardship versus judicious use. When I think of judicious or responsible use, um, I'm often thinking about the individual and how an individual uses antibiotics. And stewardship, on the other hand, um, is, um, especially when you say a stewardship program, um, stewardship programs are often structured and it's a means to judicious use. So it's a means to an end as it relates to judicious use. So um, uh, with stewardship programs, hopefully there's either an algorithm that one goes through or there's um, some formal um, stop points or um, actions that one must go through um, to make sure they're using antibiotics responsibly. Now some examples from the human health world and kind of showing you the One Health implications of that um, come from those three organizations with the CDC being the ones that folks realize um, or recognize the most often. And they often have um, different components that they highlight. Um, there's often a, a component where it's tracking or recording um, resistance patterns and things like that, but also working to develop new drugs, that's a big one. Um, more and more folks are trying to find out ways to um, develop new antimicrobials, um, especially as some of the other ones start to become resistant, and maybe even um, reducing the use to a specific sector. Another thing you'll see in stewardship programs is this nod to the core elements. So um, the CDC says, hey, if you set up a stewardship program, you should have all of these things represented in some way, shape, or form. They don't necessarily outline it um, for you for every specific hospital, knowing that the different hospitals or organizations may be different. But as you look at these um, different components, I mean, you don't necessarily see anything that would prevent it from being used in the environmental health sector or in veterinary medicine. But um, Again, with One Health, we can learn from each other's successes and failures and figure out how to get it to um, work the best, acknowledging that, hey, there may be some species differences. And one of the biggest things that we see from human health to veterinary, human medicine to veterinary medicine, is there's often less funding, not always true, depending on the situation, but the funding mechanisms differ. So the CDC may be able to get, um, have a specific source of funding they could get funding, say, from the NIH or have research that they fund through the NIH. For veterinary medicine, we have the USDA, which may, not, may or may not have money to fund specific research projects. And that's just because how our federal government and some of those organizations are set up that they have jurisdiction over specific things. Um, so you will see some differences there. Differences in professional structure, veterinary medicine versus, say, um, pharmacology, so the veterinarian, you, I joke that, you know, I'm the, the, the pharmacist, the dentist, everything, essentially. Though we do have those specialties, we have a veterinary pharmacology specialty, we have a veterinary dentistry specialty. The general practitioner does a lot um, in the veterinary world, which may be different than the human health world, 
and even with our personnel, so our, our veterinary technicians or veterinary nurses, um, you'll see some stark differences between those. Um, also, the uh, emphasis on training and awareness may be very different by, um, uh, by um, um, focus or profession. So I mentioned at the beginning, veterinarians, one health, we get it. Um, the conversation within the veterinary profession has always been, you know, how do we um, show those human health folks that, you know, what we're doing in the animal science, animal sciences is relevant to human health. And so for us, the One Health um, approach really helps us um, to take a leadership role in public health related issues, whether it's infectious disease, um, food, global food security, or in this case, antimicrobial resistance. So here are some examples of judicious use guidelines. Um, American Vet, and I've highlighted the large animal, food animal focused ones. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list or collection, a collage of images at all. The AVMA is the American Veterinary Medical Association. It's our national organization for the veterinary profession. Um, they recently just came out with, um, similar to the CDC stewardship program with the core components and they closely mirror um, the CDC's or the ones that the CDC has outlined. So we are moving away from more judicious use and towards stewardship and more formalized programs. Now Banfield, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Banfield, their corporate practice um, located in almost every PetSmart out there. Um, well, given the fact that they're corporate, it means that they have really good data. Um, they have standardized protocols that are same throughout um, different cities, states, throughout the country essentially. And so from time to time, they will put out different reports um, where they discuss various different topics. And so one of the ones they mentioned was um, uh, antimicrobial resistance and then guidelines for judicious use as it related. This is to very specific um, infections that are common in um, small animal practice. So companion animal just means cats and dogs. It also means horses depending on who you're talking to, but generally we, we restrict that for cats and dogs. Um, but it showed that 88% of the vets that were surveyed, so these are Banfield vets, weren't aware of the guidelines that um, existed for these specific bacterial infections. So it just shows that there's definitely room for improvement for training. But um, and then I just wanted to make the, the point that, again, antimicrobial resistance or antibiotic resistance is really a, a complex issue that transcends human health, animal health, environmental health, thinking again of where antibiotics are used and thus um, where we'll see resistance. And as a result, um, we really need to take a collaborative approach, whether it's in research, whether it's in um, collecting data, sharing data, we need to engage medical doctors, veterinarians, uh, wildlife researchers, et cetera, um, to help us really work together collaboratively um, to come up with a One Health solution. So um, that was kind of my intro to antimicrobial resistance as a One Health issue. Um, and now I'm gonna kind of transition and speak to um, the swine industry and what specifically has been done in the swine industry to address this issue. But before I do that, are there any questions for that first half? So um, in the swine industry, um, first of all, we do recognize that um, antimicrobial resistance is a public health threat. We know it's real. Um, and honestly, in the veterinary world, we know that, hey, if the drug's resistant, then that means if we're starting to see resistance development, develop, excuse me, that means that the things that we need to treat may not be treatable anymore. And what does that mean for animal health and welfare, which we include in our um, which is included in the veterinary oath that we take at graduation. Um, but also understanding that there is a cute, uh, larger public health impact that we need to be aware of, which is also in our oath. So in the swine industry, when it comes to um, judicious or responsible use practices, um, we at the National Pork Board, um, we have three main charges, and that's to promote or market pork products. Um, to um, conduct research to facilitate the protection of pork and um, to educate producers um, in the various areas that are relevant to their job. And so as a director, producer, and public health, sorry, as a director, producer, and public health, I oversee public health as well as um, worker safety and health related topics 
including research and education and outreach. We have a separate marketing division that handles all of the marketing, so I let them do that. But it really is, um, again, my job to educate as well as um, uh, support research in the area around public health issues, which includes antimicrobial resistance. So starting first with the education piece, we in the, the swine industry have what, what is called the Port Quality Assurance Plus Program, or P2A Plus. Um, and we essentially have a really long history of educating producers. Um, it dates back to 1989, um, where we had an educational program that was really focused on kind of FDA regulations around residue. So if you use antibiotics right now, and you know, I don't want to say since the beginning of time, but you know, there's been rules in place that if you use antibiotics in a food producing animal species, regardless of what their indication is, so if you have a pot belly pig, the rules that your pet that you're never going to eat, the rule still applies to it because it's by species, not you. Um, you have to make sure you adhere to the appropriate withdrawal time period. And all the withdrawal time period is, is the time frame of when the antibiotic um, is added to the system and when it's removed from the tissues. Because they don't want to necessarily have people um, exposed to antibiotics, say, in their food um, because the folks didn't um, hold back the animal long enough. So um, producers know um, to do this, but back in the 80s, um, there may have been some confusion or um, folks weren't really documenting um, as well when they were using things, which made adhering to that withdrawal period pretty difficult. So in 1989, the Port Quality Assurance Program came up to make sure that we were providing um, producers with that education to make sure they were providing safe pork products to the marketplace. So again, adhering to those um, withdrawal periods. Um, later on in 2006, um, we came up with a Take Care, Use Antibiotics Responsibly program. This was a separate program all about responsible antibiotic use and driving home that, as, um, especially as resistance became more, um, more of a public health issue and we were hearing it in different areas. Well, um, in 2007, the decision was made to um, merge the original Port Quality Assurance Program with that Take Care, Use Antibiotics Responsibly program, but also a swine um, welfare um, and handling program that they had all into one training program, which then was named the Port Quality Assurance Plus. So it was plus antibiotics and um, animal welfare. Port Quality Assurance Plus is a producer-driven program, so um, I should mention that the pork checkoff is a federally mandated payment that goes towards marketing, um, education, and research. Um, it was brought on by producers themselves that say, hey, that said, um, we need to pool our resources in order to um, make sure that we're continuing to sell a safe product that we are essentially insurance to stay in um, production. So make sure they're doing the appropriate research to make sure that they're producing um, swine in an efficient manner, but also staying up to date on research and training that is required. And so Port Quality Assurance Program um, coming out of that is definitely producer driven. Um, our producers will review the, the edits and changes that we've added to the booklets over time. Um, and then beyond kind of PQA plus, which was about producing a safe product, this is now about producing a safe product that was produced in such a way that protects animal welfare as well as public health. So it can be, it's you know, very one health, or at least um, comparative medicine, in that it looks at animal health and human health. It's modeled after the hazard analysis critical control points program, which is essentially um, you map out the different um, areas where things can go wrong and kind of target those. And those things are called critical control points. So you target the critical control points, make sure you educate at those specific areas. Um, and again, the ultimate uh, goal is to produce a safe and healthy pork product. Now, one of the things we tout as the success of the program is producer buy-in. And I have a slide that shows you, the next slide or two will show you um, overall buy-in of the industry. Um, and the one thing I like about it being a relatively new hire of the National Pork Board is that it's revised every three years. So this isn't um, IACUC training. How often do you have to do IACUC training? I can't remember. 
Um, but I remember, I've, since I've bounced around multiple times, a hundred times. <laughs> I just remember having moved to different institutions. The first thing I had to do was the IACUC training, but it was kind of one of those things that I did, and maybe I just didn't stay in a place long enough to have to renew it, but I didn't have to worry about it again. So there are some programs that once you start somewhere, they make you go through a training and then you never think about it again, right? So think of onboarding, new employee training. Um, Oh, perfect. So yeah, and that's important, um, and that's what I love about the PQA Plus program as well, is that it's revised every three years, so the actual program itself is updated by myself and my colleagues to make sure that it includes the most up-to-date science, but also the folks that are certified have to renew every three years, because we're changing that information, so we're making sure that they're up-to-date as well. And then I just have a note that our latest version came out in 2016, which means our next one is due out in 2019. And right now in 2018, I can tell you that we're working to finalize some of that new content that was added. And we are adding new content, and we're even changing how we're um, uh, uh, implementing some of the trainings versus, and in terms of our first time certifiers and folks that are renewing, making sure we're really targeting the needs of those two different this is um, out of date, and the reason this number is out of date, so it's their total number of folks that are PQA certified, and that's because, as I mentioned before, every three years, folks need to recertify. So if you look in the database by months, the first of each month, that number will go down or go up slightly. I think it was at 73,000 um, uh, in March, and then April, it went down to 70,000. So this slide is probably two months old, so I've just started to say over 70,000. So we have over 73,000 folks that are PQA certified. And those are barn workers, those are producers themselves, so folks that um, say own the barns. Um, those are folks like myself, so every employee of the National Pork Board is trained in the PQA program. We not only um, promote it, we are actually trained in it ourselves, and I think that's important. Um, Swine veterinarians will also participate in um, the PQA certification. And um, I'm trying to remember the total number of producers. I think there are about 60,000 producers out there. And that's why that number is bigger than that, because it includes um, all of the stakeholders, essentially, not just the producers. And this um, bullet here just uh, shows that 99.7%, so almost 100% of the packers, so the big companies that put their labels on the, the um, pork products at the end, the ones that you get at the counter. Um, the majority of them actually require that hogs come from places that are PQA plus certified. So we do have buy-in in that program, so we have the, uh, that opportunity again to um, educate our producers um, in the, the science of public health and animal welfare as well as food safety. So the program itself is broken into two parts or two steps. The first is the individual certification, so that's going through that manual, um, completing the, we have different modules that are available online now. We used to have in-person trainings. Um, and then we have a quiz at the end. It emphasizes what we call as good, what we call good production practices, practices, excuse me. So those are kind of our gold standards um, in production. And then we have a site, um, site assessment in which we go out to make sure that all the trainings were implemented so all those GPPs and the trainings were implemented on the site. And you'll see, if you go to different hog barns, it'll have a PQA Plus certified um, flyer hanging up. And then, again, as I mentioned, every three years that whole process is renewed. Now, in terms of the, you know, I don't know what this is. It may be a formatting thing. I gave a talk earlier today, and random letter just jumped across the screen. So. Apologize for that. So the PQA Plus program, as I mentioned, the origins were really a feed safety um, focus. Um, and then we added in animal welfare, animal well-being. But we also have the opportunity now in PQA Plus to emphasize public health as well as worker safety, um, environmental health, and stewardship. There's also a section on um, community engagement and community outreach for producers, really just emphasizing the importance of them getting out and sharing that story.
And so this just shows the, the layout of that PQA plus training, if you ever were to look at the manual, and then those good production practices that were emphasized in each chapter. So you can see the chapter one had a number of them, um, and some of the other chapters only had one. I can tell you with this new um, iteration, somewhat of a spoiler alert, but we are changing um, or updating those GPPs to be a little bit more specific. So I, as a director, producer, and public health, am in charge of chapter three, which is protect, or the GPPP is to protect swine and public health. So we're gonna make that a little bit more specific. We've added some more information on zoonotic infections um, for producers in order to protect themselves in the workplace um, and reduce the, uh, or prevent the transmission of zoonotic diseases but also to use antibiotics responsibly, since that's an overall, those two are the overall key um, takeaways from that chapter now. Um, and so we will, again, we, with each iteration, we work to improve this and really clarify what we want the producers to walk away with. Now within the, the chapter itself, I'll walk you through really briefly what we're training producers to do in terms of responsible antibiotic use. And so we have five principles um, for responsible use, which include, include decreasing the overall need for antibiotics, measuring the benefits or the advantages and disadvantage for each use, making sure that if we do use antibiotics that there's a measurable benefit, um, and making sure that we conduct our daily observations of pigs so walking through every day, um, checking on the animals, making sure they're okay, um, to make sure that we catch disease early on um, but overall implementing other management practices that would decrease the need for antibiotics as well. And then making sure we have, if we have to use antibiotics, that we have a veterinarian involved. So um, the use of antibiotics requires a veterinary client-patient relationship. So the veterinarian that's prescribing needs to have um, talked with the, the client or owner of the animals, in this, court, in, in this case pig farmers, and have actually seen the animals. Now, once, um, now falling under this VCPR, we have specific guidelines. The animation takes a little while to get up. Um, so there's six total guidelines that fall under that fifth principle. And it's really, again, just making sure the veterinarian is involved in the decision making for all antibiotics. So don't say, oh, well, they're sick with this, I'm just gonna give them this. So we're making sure the veterinarian's involved. Um, a lot of veterinarians will write a herd health program and say, if you see this, you know, contact me or um, use this drug for this, um, for these clinical signs, things like that. Um, we may need to make sure that we um, are able to justify each and every use, so whether that means clinical suspicion, clinical diagnosis, uh, microbiological di um, diagnostic submission, um, again, needing to justify um, each and every use, or making sure each use is justified, I should say. Um, we want to make sure we reduce the overall number of animals that need to be treated. So I'm thinking that control situation, is it the whole barn or is it just the north barn? Is it just the pen? How can we reduce the number of animals that need to be treated? Do this, populate this again. Um, this just makes a note about those medically important antibiotics um, should be used with um, careful review and have the appropriate justification. So again, making sure the use is justified. Um, this just reminds producers that mixing of um, drugs is essentially considered compounding and can only be um, conducted by a veterinarian or I think a pharmacist. Um, and so they shouldn't be mixing things together on farm. If anything needs to be mixed, if the veterinarian says to do so, then the veterinarian needs to do it. So just reinforcing that piece, that legal piece, and then making sure that we dispose of antibiotics appropriately so that we minimize um, environmental exposure. As I mentioned as well um, before, the um, step two is the side assessment. So once they've completed, once they've completed the individual training, they then have a side assessment that is conducted and it looks at specific um, aspects of swine, swine production. And again, maps back to um, maps back to the PQA plus training um, manual. We also have something that's called the Common Swine Industry Audit, which is very focused on animal welfare. Um, so we make sure that 
you know, it's not adding additional steps, but will facilitate if one were to be audited for the common swine industry audit. And this just kind of points out the percentage of the um, swine in the swine inventory, so not the producers themselves, but of the producers that are represented, the percentage of swine um, that of the industry itself that is covered by PQA plus site assessment um, and PQA plus training. So we have pretty good buy-in again. So beyond just the training, we also have um, a policy statement that we put out about three years ago um, where we really just um, reinforce that we really do believe in um, antimicrobial resistance as an emerging threat, that we um, encourage our producers to use antibiotics responsibly, that we will put an emphasis on disease prevention versus treating. Oftentimes you'll find with treatment, um, the clinical course is more advanced, so you may have to use higher doses or longer durations. So again, thinking about those bacterial populations that we're exposing, um, and each exposure, making sure that we, um, again, emphasize prevention with the overall goal of um, protecting antibiotic efficacy. So some other programming that we have out there, um, especially with the veterinary feed directive, that was a relatively um, new rule. Um, in the swine world, we had a number of drugs, like two or three of them, that required a VFD. Now all of the medically important ones that are in feed, again, um, require a VFD. Um, so we wanted to make sure that our producers were up to date. So we have this resource and it's still available and we update it with other information as it becomes available. Um, we also had, it's supposed to be US CARE, not you scare. Um, we thought about that after we released that. Um, that was just, that helps dilute the information into kind of six easily adopted steps so folks knew how to prepare for the VFD. And then we had, we worked with other um, institutions um, like the ISU and folks to develop some of our other handouts that you see here. We even had this responsible use um, supplement. It was really focused again on the VFD, that rule that was coming out in early 2017, um, but really reinforced some of the same trainings of principles and guidelines that I talked to you about earlier that's in PQA. So we have the ability beyond the PQA plus program to um, put out these little booklets as we need to, especially if it's in the, the middle of a revision year or if it's for a specific rule. So for the VFD, we knew as of January 1, 2017, we wouldn't necessarily um, need it represented in the PQA plus program. Um, or if we needed to, we could fit it in a certain way. So we, again, we just put it in a supplement and then can fold in the information that we need in subsequent revision. Again, just other um, avenues that we use to um, get the word out about the VFD and antibiotic use. And then lastly, just wanted to cover um, the pork checkoff research that we do. Um, each and every year, we've been actually, um, our producers are the ones, essentially the pork checkoff they pay, and so they tell us how they want those funds to be used. And as the Director of Producer and Public Health, I oversee, again, the public health work, including the research, and so working with them to determine budgets and how much we want to dedicate to any given issue. So you can imagine public health is really broad, zoonoses fall under that, um, zoonotic influenza will fall under that, um, but antimicrobial resistance was a, num a growing um, emerging issue, and so we'll, each year we actually dedicated more and more research dollars to it. Um, it's a finite pot, so the money is being shifted from one area to another, but again, we see the importance of dedicating those funds to it. So to put some numbers behind that, nearly $6 million are um, dedicated to antibiotic-related research in the past decade, but if you look in the past two years, and we're still, we still have about $200,000 left over, we, have, we just put out a request for proposals on antibiotic-related research. Um, so by the end of the year, it should be one point 1.8 million or 2 million, I would have to double check, um, over the years 2016 to 2018. So you can just see how essentially we're revving up um, the funding that we're dedicating to that. And so this is some of the language you'll see in our RFP if you take a look at it, it's online. Um, in terms of the research priorities, again, outlined by our producers, um, specific to antibiotic use. And so really looking at prevention versus 
or prevention versus treatment or therapeutic uses, um, how to decrease the number or comparing um, po uh, population treatment versus individual treatment, um, working to find ways to decrease the need, but also improving record keeping um, and, and development of metrics around antibiotic use. Here are some examples of some of the research topics that we've covered in the, or funded, I should say, in the past few years. Um, uh, again, antibiotic alternatives, so what happens if we do have resistance? What can we use in place of those antibiotics to treat disease or to prevent disease? Ultimately, it's important to say that, you know, collaboration is definitely key. Again, this is a One Health issue. It's not, um, you know, uh, not limited to just the swine industry. We're seeing it in other um, food animal species. We're seeing it in companion animal species. And we do work um, collaboratively with other members of the barnyard, so other food animal species groups, um, poultry, so chicken and turkeys, um, beef, dairy, um, et cetera, to um, find ways to, again, share our successes and failures around antimicrobial efficacy. And so this is um, my last slide, actually. Oh, I think I have one more after this. This is an infographic that we came up with at the National Pork Board. Again, it links you back to our resource page, if you, especially for our producers, if they want to learn more about what we've done. Um, one Health Day was November 3rd, or is November 3rd each year. And so um, I actually gave a talk at the vet school at Iowa State University. So I'm located in Des Moines, Iowa. I don't know if that was said. Um, but uh, we, we put together this infographic to really highlight, again, um, the One Health aspect of swine production in and of itself. So we have a vision statement that we put out um, that's linked to our strategic plan every 10 years or so. Um, and this most recent one, and if you come into the office, if you find yourself in um, Clive, Iowa, which is just north of Des Moines, you'll find this decal actually on the wall right outside our main entrance. And um, we ultimately, as producers and as members of the pork board, want to do what's right for um, people, pigs, and planets. So you can see humans, animals, and the environment. So we really do take a One Health approach to swine production, and that's why we want to be part of this solution. Um, I always end with a very corny slide uh, when I talk about One Health, and that is One Health is an umbrella that we as, um, as researchers, as technicians, or whatever role we play, especially talking to students at um, an agricultural-focused school, um, you easily can find your, your um, place in that One Health umbrella. Um, and it's all about, again, working collaboratively across those different sectors to really um, to live up to the One Health name. So again, I really think that you guys are the future of One Health, as corny as that sounds. Um, but I do think it's true. And um, when it comes to operationalizing One Health, I definitely think you'll find your niche. Um, but always be thinking of, OK, well, what is this topic? Sure, I can focus on this. And, and you know, you'll develop expertise in a very specific area. But think of what other areas were overlapped. So if you're working with wildlife or even domestic animal species, how, do, um, how does the environment, what role does the environment play? And if you don't know that answer, you need to grab someone that has that expertise, right? And so you'll fill in one niche, they can fill in another niche, and then you can work together collaboratively to address those answers. And if, uh, um, again, <laughs> pulling the whole framework in, if it has implications for human health, making sure that those individuals are brought to the table and included in those conversations. One thing I will say about One Health, um, from time to time, especially from the animal health side, um, you may find yourself excluded from those conversations. So, well, did they bring in an ecologist? Did they bring in a wildlife behaviorist? Did they bring in, you know, these folks that can actually speak from a, a a point of expertise on this given issue, um, you'll find out, no, well, then maybe you need to be that person. So I encourage you to get out there and start participating in those conversations, because sometimes you just need to knock on the door and say, no, this is you know, a One Health topic, or you guys are talking about animal health, and I am a veterinarian, I am a technician, I am, you know, um, insert animal health career here. Um, and I need to be part of this conversation because I have expertise that can definitely help work towards the solution. So with that, I will take questions.
One, two. Any questions? So I think you covered this in a more like broad mm -hmm. way, but um, is the amount of antibiotics given to feed animals enough to cause humans to become uh, antibiotic resistant? So that is a complex question, and I think it's, it goes to how complex antimicrobial resistance is. And so I often just lean, I'm, I'm going to pivot to not answer that question. Um, I think it is, the answer is we don't know. We know that yeast drives resistance, and we know that there's a lot of microbial sharing. But in terms of attribution, like me treating this cat and then the cat developing resistance, then giving it, putting it in the environment and then giving it to you and then you going to the doctor, we've, I don't know we've, we've ever mapped that out. But we do know, again, antibiotics are used in all three sectors. We know that there's a lot of microbial sharing, but attribution is pretty difficult. our standard, the FDA and your standards for pork residue or antibiotic residue and resi uh, antibiotic resistance um, affect pork exports? That's a good question. So the question was, how does FDA, so we do, we promote, we educate producers, excuse me, on what the FDA sets as the um, limit. But we also have on our website at pork.org, forget what comes after the slash, but different states, or excuse me, oh, different countries have different rules on different drugs. And so um, our, our producers and our packers will know that if I'm targeting, targeting country A, they don't like if we use this, or they have a longer withdrawal period. Drug X should be 42 days, but they want 60 days. So we have that information, and that rule is actually, it's written by country essentially, and some countries have a full-out ban on certain antimicrobials in general. So if you're trying to sell your pigs to, again, country A, um, you need to be aware of those rules. So that's a great question. All right, hello. Um, first, I want to thank you for coming out. It was a very uh, interesting talk. Um, but I guess my question would be for students in the audience who are interested in the um, veterinary field or maybe pursuing something like this, what advice would you give them? Sure. So um, at the beginning, I, I kind of walked you guys through my career trajectory. Um, and again, I thought I'd be playing with puppies and kittens all day, which still sounds pretty awesome, but I enjoy playing with pigs as well. Um, and understanding that they will become food and that, you know, helping to feed the world. Um, I think be open. You'll, you'll get to veterinary school and be hit with a lot of information. So for those of you that are interested in, in the veterinary profession, one, I should mention, I should backtrack and say there's, um, uh, you can be a vet tech, a vet assistant, or a veterinarian. Um, you can be a practice manager. There's so many different um, avenues to go into veterinary medicine with different amount of responsibility and, and training and things like that. But if you're interested in veterinary school itself, I say be open. Um, a lot of our veterinary schools have, um, not all, but some of them will have tracks. So you come in small animal and that's all you can do, or you come in equine. Um, whereas others, it's a little more open where everybody learns everything and then once you don't go to do your clinicals is when you specialize. And I know of you know, a handful of students that came in, think they were gonna do small animal work and um, left as swine veterinarian. So I would say be open to that. Um, be open to the alternative careers out there. If you wanna do public health, no, I don't play with puppies and kittens every day or I don't play with pigs every day. I actually you know, fight resistance from my desk. Um, but, you know, through my words, through training and things like that. Um, but just be open to that. You can have, you could be a regulator. Um, you could work for USDA, FDA, help write some of these regulations. There's so many different things that you can do. So I would say be open to it. And um, one of the things I would uh, actually um, encourage is, you know, start to get those experiences now. To get into veterinary school, they require you have so many hours. 
So try to get a varied experience. Don't just work with the cats and dogs. Um, because some folks get a little frustrated or flustered when they get to veterinary school and they're like, you know what, I really like this. I didn't think I was going that route. Also during the summers as well as your veterinary schools, you get all of two depending on where you go to vet school and then you work throughout the rest um, to get some experience in that free time. Um, is there any, um, so, with uh, Port Checkoff, in terms of um, like other companies mm -hmm. that produce pork and everything, um, are they required to be associated with your company, or is it just strongly recommended in a sense? With the Port Checkoff, or yes. So the Port Checkoff is a mandatory federal mandate that is overseen by the USDA, and that was producer driven. They themselves said it could have been, you know, everybody put around a collection plate, and I think they actually did that the first time. They said, no, we need something that's more organized, because you can imagine that if all the folks here, all the students represented here said, hey, we need to put our funds together and start a, I don't know, an organization for students. You may have other students that benefit from it, but don't pay in, and so it's just, it's federally mandated. It makes it a lot easier. With the implement with the implementation of the VFD on 1117, have you seen data yet that verifies or shows that through the years 2017, have we used less antibiotics in the livestock industry? So um, the FDA does a report of sales data. So it's based on invoicing um, the amount of drugs that a different distributor will sell. So they won't have that, and they're usually, I should say, they're a, a year behind. So they released 2016 data in 2017, in December 2017, so we won't have anything that starts to show any kind of trend until December of this year. But we are looking forward to see that, to seeing that. Again, it's also important to mention that sales don't often translate directly to on-farm use, and so we are looking at um, building within stewardship programs that we're working, or we're looking into finding ways to better record our antibiotic use. Um, one, to show that we're using it judiciously, so producers can double check indication, duration, and all those things, but also to monitor um, uh, overall use. I have a really off the wall question. Go for it. Uh, so to me, this is a really big One Health question related to pork production. And so here in Pennsylvania, anyway, there's, there's a growing, and I don't know how fast this is growing, but gentlemen farmers who want to raise swine in open enclosures. Uh, a, sometimes I think some of these folks aren't quite aware that the pigs can get out. Uh, and so we end up with feral hog issues. And Pennsylvania has now a pretty serious feral hog issue. And so I, I'm wondering if, uh, if your organization is really looking at whether this is a growing trend, do they make any recommendations, do they uh, really see the environmental implications from this and try to drive that home to producers as well? That's a good point. And so when you say open enclosures, are you meaning outdoors? Yeah, that the, outdoors? There, there are some who are essentially Versus wanting like free range houses. swine. Perfect, okay, yes. So, um, and at the National Pork Board, we represent the whole industry, and so you'll see some diversity within there. I was not aware of the feral hog issue in Pennsylvania. Coming from Washington and hearing from places like Texas, you see, yeah, the, Hogs can be very destructive to the environment. And we do have, um, one of my colleagues is the director, um, I should mention, so in our, the, the way the pork board is set up, we're set up in departments by our three goals of research, education, and um, marketing or promotion. I'm in the, the research or science and technology department, and then we have each specialty. So we have an animal welfare, animal scientist. We have someone that looks at environmental health and stewardship. And so that piece is really focused on understanding our carbon footprint, um, efficiency, and production. And so that would fall into that realm. Um, we don't necessarily, as um, an organization, say you have to produce this way, but we are making folks 
aware of, you know, we have a tool, a carbon footprint calculator that producers can use and um, kind of um, adjust to see ways to improve their carbon footprint. Are there any particular uh, microbial concerns from, from having swine in those kinds of conditions? Um, parasitic. So um, when you raise, um, if, if you raise pigs outdoors, we raised, we moved pigs from outdoors to inside because um, we can better control that environment. And if you've ever been in the hog barn, I know you guys have one um, on campus here. Um, so I haven't seen the inside, so, but I'll comment that they generally have slatted floors so the manure can fall through. A lot of our parasitic infections, again, if you've had microbiology, they can be, we call them old poop disease or new poop disease or fresh poop diseases, I guess. Um, and so if there is, if they are harboring some kind of helminth or something, um, it can be infectious to other animals. And so having those slatted floors can help it go through. And if you've been in hog barns, you can see it still kind of cakes up. But also having them um, indoors, you can decon in between pigs to make sure you kill anything in the environment. It's really hard to kill things in the natural environment, how to, how to treat this, how to clean soil. So there are some risks there of different things and just that environment being a great, the soil being a great substrate to hold on to some of those things. You may, may see some of those risks. Um, and there are, um, and they should, Hopefully, folks that are producing pigs in that way are working with their veterinarians on ways to um, prevent disease or to identify disease um, because certain worms, say um, Ascaracuus, which is a helminth in pigs, can be zoonotic. So we want to make sure that that's not present in the tissues um, at the time the pigs are slaughtered. If you don't mind, I'm going to do a commercial here. I teach a swine a science class here at DelVal, and I am an advisor with the National Pork Board. And if you take the class in the fall, you will be certified in PQA Plus and PQA Plus Transport. So it's two certifications that you can put on your resume. So you sign up for classes this week, so get on swine science. Yeah, I like it. So the as 70,000 individuals that are certified, I like that. The Delaware Valley Food Systems Institute has just passed a new minor program in a food uh, systems. Food systems minor, yeah, that's it. Right, food systems minor, and you can specialize your education um, into any of the general um, areas. And taking the swine science class um, is one of the elective options um, for you under the food systems minor. So it is an excellent way to bridge your different knowledges. Thank you. Commercial over. Promoting pork, I like it. Fulfilling the mission. Any other questions? Any more advertisements? Any club meetings that need to happen? No? Well, thank you so much. <laughs>